about uh, two years ago, we received this letter at headquarters. I feel as if through this publication that Jesus is making a shepherding call on me. Another wrote, When I fin finished reading this book, I held it close to my heart as I did with the Draw Close to Jehovah book some years earlier. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the book, Come Be My Follower. Now, obviously, what they're talking about is uh, this book that was released at our district conventions back in 2007. And as you may realize by now, the Kingdom Ministry recently announced that starting in March, after we finish the God's Love book at our congregation Bible studies each week, we will be going through this book, Come Be My Follower. So I thought it would be good if we could kind of get an overview of this book to kind of whet our appetite for what is to come. Now what I'd like to do is focus on four things. Uh, first, why was this book published? Uh, second, how is it organized? Third, what does it contain? And then fourth, how can you benefit from a careful reading of this book? So first off, why was it published? Well, the Come Be My Follower book was not intended to give a summary of the life and ministry of Jesus. That actually was the purpose of the Greatest Man book published some 20 years ago. That book summarizes Jesus' ministry in chronological order. This book was written for different reasons. Uh, really, there are three reasons why it was written. First, it's designed to help us to focus on Jesus' qualities and ways so that we can follow him or imitate him. You see, the Greatest Man book did not contain any application. It just reported what the gospel said. This book throughout has application. So all along, when you're reading, the book will at times almost compel you to stop and ask yourself, Am I really following Jesus as closely as I can? How can I follow him more closely? So there's lots of application. Now, the second reason why the book was produced is that it was intended as kind of a complement to the book Draw Close to Jehovah, which was released five years earlier. Uh, this book is very much written in the same style and with the same tone as the Draw Close to Jehovah book. And really, one of the best ways to draw close to Jehovah is by following Jesus' example closely. Now, why is that? Well, if you brought a copy of the book, if you turn over to page 9, in paragraph 10, about halfway down, the book explains why following Jesus will bring us closer to Jehovah. It says... The perfect reflection of his heavenly Father. Jesus possessed every divine quality in full measure. He was all that a perfect human could be. So in everything that he did, in every word that he uttered, in every inner feeling that he revealed, we find something worth imitating. Now, you might remember John 14, 9, Jesus said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. Back in the 1970s, the Watchtower, in commenting on that scripture, made a rather striking point. It said that what that means, and what this is saying, really, is that if Jehovah God had lived on earth, he would have conducted himself exactly as Jesus did. So the closer we follow Jesus, the closer we will be coming to the one he imitated, Jehovah God. And that's the second reason why the book was produced. There's a third reason why it was produced, and it is because the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and ministry deserve our special, careful attention. Now, why is that? Well, I might explain it this way. Is everything that Jesus said and did recorded in the Bible? No. 
the end of John's Gospel, it said the world could not contain the scrolls written, right? But now what does that mean? Of everything Jesus said and did, certain things were selected and put into the Gospels, right? Who decided which things would end up in the Bible? Jehovah did, because he inspired the Gospel writers. Now it's kind of interesting to reflect on that, right? Here, of everything Jesus said and did, and so much wasn't recorded, Jehovah God chose, selected the ones that he wanted in the Gospels. I might illustrate it this way. You might have a, a photo album. You want to make it a family photo album. Maybe you have thousands of family photographs to look through. So you look through and you select, you choose the photos that present your loved ones in the best possible way. And you put them in the album for others to see. Well, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in a sense are like Jehovah's photo album of his son. He personally chose the verbal portraits or photos to put in those accounts. How should we feel about those Bible books? Clearly, they deserve our special attention. Now, how is this book organized? Well, if you open to the table of contents on page 3, You'll notice that the first two chapters are designed to lay a foundation for the book. And then starting with chapter 3, the book is divided into three sections. Right? Section 1, Come and See the Christ, kind of gives us an overview of Jesus' qualities. So it talks about his humility, uh, his courage, his wisdom, his obedience, his endurance. Section 2 talks about his ministry of preaching and teaching. So as you read through Section 2 repeatedly, the book will pause and ask you to think about how you can imitate Jesus in your ministry. And then Section 3, and similar to the Close to Jehovah book, the last section discusses the most important aspect of the subject, and that is the love that Christ demonstrated. So as the chapters progress, we talk about his love for God, his love for his followers in particular, his love for others in general, and then chapter 18 actually concludes not just section 3, but the book as a whole. As I mentioned, the book is designed to get us to think about how we can be like Jesus. If you turn to page 34, beginning with chapter 3, which is the first chapter of the three sections, each of the chapters has a teaching box. How can you follow Jesus? Now this box is a little different from the teaching box we just reviewed in our Watchtower lesson. In your Watchtower study articles each week, the teaching box is a review of what we studied in that lesson, right? These boxes in the book are not reviews of the chapters. In fact, the scriptures cited in these boxes are not discussed in the chapters. These are designed to take other scripture accounts that bear on the subject that was discussed, but again, to get us to think in terms of how can we be more like Jesus? How can we follow him more closely? Now, the third thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is what does the book contain that should catch our interest? Well, the first thing we might talk about is some of the beautiful artwork. There are 18 chapters in this book. 14 of them feature a full-page painting of a Bible scene. Now, a lot of research goes into the paintings. For example, if you turn over to page 99, this is in the section on Jesus' ministry. And uh, this is the chapter entitled, It is Written About Jesus' Use of the Bible, right? So here's a painting of Jesus in the synagogue of Nazareth, reading from Isaiah's scroll. Now when the artists work on these paintings, they want to be sure that the paintings are accurate down to very small details, right? Now according to Luke chapter 4, Jesus on this occasion was reading from what is now Isaiah chapter 61. There are 66 chapters in Isaiah. 
the scrolls in the synagogues were written in Hebrew and Hebrew was written from right to left so if you can see the, the picture there most of the scroll is rolled up and being held in which of Jesus hands you see that well, you have two choices, right? Right or left? <laughs> in which of his hands? And it's a, not as easy to see here. The, the original painting is hanging in the conference room in the writing department, and it's easy to see there. But most of the scroll is in his right hand. And that is appropriate, again, because Hebrew was written from right to left. But there were no chapter and verse divisions in Jesus' day. And Luke's account says he took the scroll and found the place where it was written. So the Lord was so familiar with the scrolls, he knew exactly how to unroll it to get to exactly the verses that he wanted to read. And it's a beautiful <coughs> example of how Jesus was familiar with the Bible, so much captured in, in a simple painting. To look at another painting, if you skip over to page 143, this is a painting of uh, the account we read and talked about yesterday in the discussion uh, when the children were brought to Jesus. Now, we've had paintings of this uh, many different times over the years in our publications, but I don't think we've ever portrayed this more beautifully than it is here. Now, as you look at this painting, let me just open this for discussion. What impresses you, Sister Wells? Um, what catches my eye right away is just um, Jesus' facial expression and how he truly looks happy to be with all the kids. Good. What else do you see that impresses you, please, Sister Eve? I just loved how comfortable the children are, that they're the ones leaning on his shoulder. The other one wants to be with him, is pointing. Because I know when I was little, there were certain circuit overseers I would do this to, and other ones I was about 20 feet away from them. <laughs> So these children felt very comfortable to come out to Jesus. Very true. Please, bring the cut there. It seems as, as if one of uh, this, this young boy in front of him is talking, and Jesus has his eyes locked on to every word that this young boy is, is, is saying. There's so much you could pick out, and again, the original of this is also in the conference room in the writing department, but... This little guy leaning on Jesus' shoulder, if you look, you'll see that he's got his arm around Jesus, right? His right hand, the boy's right hand, is on Jesus' shoulder. Jesus is holding this little girl's hand. The little boy sitting on Jesus' right arm. His little toes are curled, if you look at the bottom of the picture. And as we talked about yesterday, whereas uh, Matthew says and Mark that they brought children to Jesus... Luke, in his account, uses the word infant, infants, right? And how is that accurately illustrated in the painting? What do you see? Please. That Jesus is actually holding one of the infants in his hand. Yeah, because remember, one translation says he took the children into the crook or bend of his arm, right? Some of them were infants. And there's one thing that impressed me in the painting almost more than anything else. If you look on the left side of the painting, there's this Jewish mother, right, with a red headband, and she's looking over at Jesus and the children, and she has this beautiful expression on her face, doesn't she? Because one or more of her children are in the arms of Jesus. And it reminds me of a saying I heard some years ago, that if you take a child by the hand, you take his mother by the heart. Because few things will touch the heart of a mother more deeply than if someone shows a kindness to her children. And that's what you're seeing illustrated here. One more example, if you turn over to page 166. This is in connection with um, Jesus' love and in particular his willingness to forgive. Uh, now as you recall, Peter denied Jesus not once but three times, right, on the final night of Jesus' life. As you look at the painting there on page 166, which of the three denials is being depicted? Is it the first, the second, or the third? Well, the Schaefer says the third. Yes, and that's right. And why? Well, again, as the artists work on the paintings, they look carefully at the Bible accounts. And when you compare the gospel accounts of Peter's denials, only Luke 
in his account mentions a little detail that is reflected in this painting. It's Luke alone who says, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Now again, you put yourself in Peter's place. You deny knowing Jesus the third time. And then Peter looks up, and there's Jesus looking him right in the eye. And that's what's being captured in this painting. So just a three of the 14 paintings found in the book, which are designed to teach us much. Now something else that the book contains are vivid introductions. Starting with chapter 3, the introduction to each chapter is actually written in the present tense. And that is by design, so that it pulls you into the account and hopefully makes you feel as if you're right there while it's happening. And then beginning with the first subheading, each chapter reverts to the past tense, since it's talking about something historical. But the introduction, each of the introductions from chapter 3 and on, are in the present tense. Now, as an example, if you look at page 35, this is in the chapter that talks about Jesus' courage, right? Now, let me just read the opening paragraph and see if it doesn't make you feel as if you're right there while this is happening. It says a mob is coming after Jesus, armed with swords and clubs and with soldiers among them. The men form a large crowd. As if guided by a single malevolent will, they move through the darkened streets of Jerusalem and across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives. The mood is full, yet they carry torches and lamps. Do they light their way because clouds block the moonlight? Or do they expect their quarry to be hiding in the shadows? One thing is certain. Anyone who expects Jesus to cower knows little of the man. I mean, don't you feel as if you're right there while this is happening? And again, that's just one of many of the introductions written in the present tense. Something else about the book that I think is worthy of note is that there is some excellent word illustrations. I mean, when you think about the use of illustrations in teaching, perhaps you can remember an illustration that you heard in a talk maybe 10, 20, or more years ago. There's something about a well-phrased or simple illustration that just lodges itself in your memory and almost refuses to be forgotten. Now, the book has some good illustrations. For example, if we look over at uh, page 67... This is in connection with defining endurance. Is endurance simply a matter of this encountering inescapable hardship, or does it involve more? Well, the book illustrates it this way. This is in paragraph 5 on page 67, about a third of the way down. It says, consider an illustration. Two men are imprisoned in similar conditions, but for very different reasons. One a common criminal, begrudgingly serves his sentence with sad-faced compliance. The other, a true Christian in prison for his faithful course, stands his ground and keeps a positive attitude because he sees his situation as an opportunity to demonstrate his faith. The criminal can hardly be considered an example of endurance, whereas a loyal Christian exemplifies this sterling quality. Just a very simple but clear illustration, right, about what endurance involves. Not just encountering hardship, but having the right attitude while encountering hardship. One more thing about the book I'd like to comment on is that throughout there are some fresh insights and powerful applications. It's not as if there's new light but sometimes a fresh way of looking at old light or established light. For example, if you go back to page 34, this is the chapter that talked about Jesus' humility. And in making application, I like the way it's expressed in paragraph 23. And see if this doesn't drive home to you the importance of being humble in our dealings with others. It says, 
Haughtiness is like poison. The effects can be devastating. It is a quality that can render the most gifted human useless to God. Humility, on the other hand, can make even the least one useful to Jehovah. Isn't that powerful? And especially for brothers who may reach out for privileges or responsibilities in the congregation, to be a ministerial servant or an elder, never forget the importance of humility. As it says here, no matter how gifted you may be as a speaker or with knowledge, no matter how gifted you may be, if you don't have humility, then you are useless to Jehovah. But even a very ordinary man with a humble heart, Jehovah can use him to do extraordinary things. Just a beautiful reminder, especially for the brothers who want to take uh, on responsibility. Another example of, a, I think, a beautiful insight, if you turn over to page 71, and this is in the chapter that talks about Jesus' endurance, and in paragraph 14, it comments on why Jesus was able to endure what he did, and it makes two very simple, but I think profound points. It says there in the second sentence, paragraph 14, there are two outstanding factors that sustain Jesus. First, he looked above, appealing to the God who supplies endurance. Second, Jesus looked ahead, focusing on what his endurance would lead to. Now just think about that for a moment. The two things that sustain Jesus. He looked above, and he looked ahead. And the same two things can sustain us, no matter what you may face in life. I mean, whether it's the death of a loved one, depression, the loss of a job, other, no matter what challenge you may face in life, like Jesus, you too can endure if you do those two things. Look above, right? Throwing your burden on Jehovah, calling upon him in prayer. And then look ahead. I mean, look ahead to the kingdom blessings, no matter what we have to endure now. Compared to the blessings that are in store under the kingdom to come, it makes anything we have to endure well worth the effort involved. But just a beautiful, beautiful description. One more example, if you turn over to page 165. We've been hearing a lot lately about family worship and with the adjustment in the meeting schedule. Uh, we've been encouraged to set aside time for family worship and especially family heads have been urged to make this a regular thing in your family, right? Providing for your family, not just materially, but spiritually. Now, how important is it in God's eyes for a man to take the lead in providing spiritually for his family. I think it's expressed rather powerfully in paragraph 9 on pages 164 and 165. And it has to do with the fact that when Jesus was hanging on the stake, and remember his mother Mary was there and the apostle John, and you remember what happened, right? Jesus said to John, see your mother. Right, And he told Mary, see your son. Now, Jesus' brothers and sisters were not as yet exercising faith in him. And Jesus knew that while they might take care of Mary materially, they would not have taken care of her spiritually, at least not as of that moment. But he knew that the Apostle John was a faithful lover of God. And so Jesus entrusted Mary into the care of John so that she would be cared for spiritually. Okay, we've heard that before. But what was so interesting to me in this paragraph is the context of it. The paragraph explains that you have to remember, Jesus was hanging on the stake, right? I mean, his feet were nailed into the stake. His hands were fastened above him. Now, speech involves exhaled breath, right? To speak, you have to breathe in, and then you can breathe out and form words that can be heard. But now Jesus was hanging on that stake. In order to breathe, he had to step on his feet, which drove the nails deeper into his feet. And if he wanted to kind of push himself up to breathe, 
it would cause his back to rub against the stake, and he had been scourged prior to being impaled. Now what that means, and as this paragraph explains, is that every word that Jesus uttered on that stake had to cause him excruciating pain. I mean, if you knew that every word you spoke would cause you that kind of pain, would you not choose your words carefully? Jesus only spoke six or seven times on the stake, but among the things he felt it important enough to say was, Mary, see your son, John, see your mother, so that Mary would be cared for spiritually. I mean, if that doesn't emphasize to us how important it is in the eyes of Christ and certainly in the eyes of his follower, his father, for a man to provide spiritually for his family, then what is? Just a powerful way to emphasize that to us. But now, how can you benefit from reading through the Come Be My Follower book? Well, let me share with you what a few readers have said. For one thing, reading through the book can help to stimulate your zeal for the ministry. One reader put it this way, I've been reading it ever since I've received it. It's truly changing my life. I'm feeling spiritually transformed. I've arranged my affairs so that I can begin full-time pioneering in September. That's how this brother felt after reading the Come Be My Follower book. The book can also help you to become more like Christ. And really, who of us would not want to become more like Christ? Uh, one family wrote in and said this, This should be required reading for all brothers wanting to reach out for ministerial servant, elder, or any special full-time service. Because really, if we're going to take on responsibility in the congregation, we really ought to be as much like Christ as possible. And finally, in harmony with the purpose of this book, it can really help you to feel closer, not just to Jesus, but more important, to Jehovah. As uh, one sister wrote, I want to thank you so much for the book, Come Be My Follower. It's an amazing book. Most importantly, it has helped me to draw closer to Jehovah, and that makes everything in life better. If you haven't as yet read the book, why not make it a goal to do so before we start studying it in March? Read it carefully. Dissect it. Think about it. Think about how you can apply it. And who knows, maybe you too, after a careful reading of this book, will come to feel as if Jesus is making a shepherding call on you. And we certainly hope that to be the case. Thank you. just want to say um, what a pleasure it is for Joanne and I to be able to come out and visit with you here in Fountain Valley. And as I mentioned yesterday, we hear so much about you from Shane and Yvonne. And it's really so heartwarming for us to see the way you care about them and they care about you. I also want to say uh, once again how much it means to my wife and I to be able to do this. Um, and I have mentioned this before, I think, but it bears repeating. Is I recognize that working at Bethel is a wonderful privilege, but it is a rather sheltered way of life. And we never, ever want to forget that you brothers and sisters are kind of in the trenches. I mean, this is the real world, and we don't ever want to lose sight of that. So when we get to come out and visit and talk with you, listen to what you're dealing with, it gives us a little dose of reality that we take home and I can tell you honestly, with all my heart, that that helps me to be better at my work. And that would not be possible if, as a congregation, you didn't agree to do this. So whatever it may do for you, please know what it does for us. Thank you very, very much.